Hi, I'm Trevor Harriet. I'm a writer and naturalist, and I'm the guest birder for the Spring Song Bird Festival this year. I've done it in the past, and in, in, uh, of course, on Pelee Island, where we get to go for bird walks together in person, <laughs> as opposed to over technology, and uh, and then and then do a bit of a bird talk later on in the weekend. Um, so we're going to try to to do that a bit here. I'm going to take folks on a virtual bird tour to see some of the Aspen Parkland Prairie where I do some bird watching in Saskatchewan. It's one of my favorite parts of um, Canada's grassland regions, partly because it's a mix of grassland birds in the open areas and the woodland birds, birds in the Aspen bush. Uh, then after that short video, uh, I'm going to switch to um, a slide talk which will uh, focus on the grassland birds in general all over Canada that are uh, in decline and, and facing some um, some difficulties but uh, uh, then we will wrap the whole thing up with a short video about a protected area that um, is soon to be announced I think by the federal government. All right sit tight and here we go. So I'm out here on a little birding track using eBird this morning. This is April 17th. It's been a cold, cold spring so far. Uh, and nothing at all like Pelee Island at a spring song festival. But this is where I do a lot of birding and I certainly start in April because the birds are arriving already. We've got lots of snow geese flying over the meadowlarks are back. Gophers are running around in the field just over here. So I'm using an eBird on my iPad and uh, Certainly socially isolating and haven't seen a human being all morning. So the, the landscape you see behind me is, uh, is a kind of, of grassland. It's one of the grassland ecoregions in Canada. It's called the Aspen Parkland Prairie. And it's the one that I identify with most. It's a nice mix of the native grasses in between Aspen bush, or bluffs we call them, and uh, you know, there's a lot of wetlands here too, so it's a tremendous mix of bird diversity and lots of fun. If you ever get out to Saskatchewan, Alberta, or Manitoba, there's a lot of aspen parkland. Most of it doesn't have its native grass left, but there's still a lot of life here. And uh, because there's that sort of interspersed mix of bush and sloughs, uh, we sometimes call it a savanna. A savanna grassland and I love that term because it reminds me that this area was at one time North America's Serengeti. There were of course millions of bison. There were the pronghorns and there were all there was a lot of elk. Uh, there were wolves and some grizzly bears chasing them all. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a place that has a great history and a history, of course, of, of loss and, and change. But the birds here, most of them remain. Um, there's, there's been changes in the bird, bird life for sure over the last century, century and a half. But it's still a rich place with a lot of bird diversity. And the birds, to me, testify to what remains here. Bush. Coolies. And sloughs. Coolies, bush, and sloughs. That's what makes up the Aspen Parkland. One of the things I love about prairie birding, grassland birding in the Aspen Parklands, you can be up looking at Sprague's pipits and Baird sparrows up on the plains and then come down into one of these valleys, uh, a glacial meltwater channel like this one right here in the upper Indian Head Creek. And there's woodland birds, there's orioles, there's red-eyed vireos, there's rough grouse and uh, sometimes oven birds, pileated woodpeckers. It's the combination that's so cool here, that you get this effect of um, kind of 
bits of the eastern hardwood forest ecology and mixing and intermingling with grassland ecologies, cheek by jowl. Uh, it just it just makes for some really rich and fun birding experiences. So there's a pair of bald eagles nesting here on uh, the edge of a, a large prairie lake, well, medium-sized prairie lake. And this is kind of a new phenomenon. Over the last 10 years, we're seeing more bald eagles nesting out on the, the northern parts of the Great Plains. And it's an exciting recovery to watch. This pair has nested here for a couple of years now. Last year, they uh, they fledged one, one uh, nestling from the nest, and we're hoping they're going to do well again this year. So when you walk inside one of these aspen bluffs on a spring morning, here it is, you know, getting toward the end of April, still looking pretty wintry. Um, they're, they're composed mostly of aspen trees. You will get the odd maple. Uh, I think there's an ash tree or two in this area too, but this is mostly aspen poplar. One of the cool things about aspen is that it lives in large clones. Uh, there's estimates that uh, aspen clones are some of the largest organisms on the planet. There's one in Utah that goes for several square kilometers because they're connected underground. You know it because they green up all at the same time, a leaf out at the same time, and then in the fall especially you can see it when they all turn yellow in a single clone. You can pick out the clones on a hillside or in a, in a bluff together. What kind of birds are in these aspen bluffs? Uh, well, there's a pretty good mix of eastern hardwood forest birds. There's uh, a few warblers, certainly red starts, oven birds. In wet spots, you'll sometimes find a uh, northern water thrush if it's in a valley. And there's a creek going by. There's yellow warblers. And again, in the deeper coulees and ravines, you get towhees, both eastern and the spotted towhee, and alder and least flycatcher, especially least flycatcher. I've found uh, eastern wood peewee here. Here it comes. And there's the ruffed grouse. This one's not too far away. If I look down here in the... I might be able to find him. And it was a rough grouse. I snuck on my belly and found it through the thicket. I could see it. On the way home, I found one of my favorite prairie birds of the spring, the sandhill crane. They were making their sounds right by the roadside and landing. Now I'm going to do a little talk and slideshow about the birds that need grassland. Whether it's a hay meadow, an alvar, a tall grass prairie in Manitoba, Ontario, or the big expanses of prairie in Alberta and Saskatchewan. These birds, the grassland birds, from the it's Ipswich savannah sparrows of Sable Island in Nova Scotia to the Lombo curlews and burrowing owls uh, that nest in British Columbia's interior, they're amongst the least protected and most threatened species on the planet. 
So a lot of the photos I'm going to show you here come from a, a book that I did just recently, a couple of years ago, with Branimir Jetvi, a very skilled grassland photographer. So most of them are his. Some of the photos uh, are by another photographer, including some of the bird photos, by Hamilton Greenwood. A few of the really poor quality photos are probably mine. Um, anyway, so here we go. Here's a couple grassland shots from Branimir. This is a beautiful image from the book. It's... Uh, just just uh, east of the Rocky Mountains in a big wide open prairie with a lot of flowers. And here's a shot in Saskatchewan, the big expanses of the remaining large pieces of grassland near Grasslands National Park. So why are birds in trouble? Well, it's simple as habitat loss. You know, this shows this is World Wildlife Fund plow print and report. They put one of these out every year. And it just shows how much grassland we've lost. The white areas on the, the map on the right is is all the, the areas of the Great Plains that have been plowed. And as you can see in Saskatchewan, we have some of the highest rates of grassland loss. Now we estimate we may be down to somewhere between 8 and 10% of our native grassland in the province. And, of course, that leads to a lot of concerns for conservation. There's this thing called the Conservation Risk Index on, all over the planet. We're looking at various habitats and kind of comparing the habitat converted versus habitat protected. And right at the top of the list of doing the worst is temperate grasslands, as you can see in this chart. It has a, a CRA, or Conservation Risk Index, of 10.1. And the nearest uh, to that would be Mediterranean forests at 8.2. So, on to the birds. Here's a, uh, a lovely photo that Brownover took of uh, what Frugianus hawk being chased by eastern kingbird. It's a threatened species in Canada, but it's actually doing pretty well. It seems to be recovering quite well lately. Here's its uh, neighbor, the Butio, in the Butio family, the Swainson's hawk, which migrates all the way to, to Argentina every, every winter. And they got in some trouble there back in the 90s with um, some pesticides for grasshoppers, but they've recovered pretty well since then. They're, they're not on the endangered list. They're doing pretty good. Another bird that population, although know, it's declining slowly, still a pretty abundant bird, and that's the sharp-tailed grouse. At this time of year, they're on their lecking or dancing grounds, looking much like this in the early sunshine of the spring morning. Here's one of my favorite birds uh, of the prairie, uh, upland sandpiper. These guys are in in much of Canada, actually, in open grass and area, grass areas, and they don't they don't actually always require native grassland, which has kind of helped them along. They um, haven't declined as fast as some of the other grassland species because they'll use airports and sod plantations, uh, sod farms, and so on. The largest um, shorebird in North America, the Lombo curlew, is on our endangered list. This is a photo by Hamilton Greenwood. It's another shot of one up on open prairie. Just a magnificent bird. Makes a great, great sound as it comes comes at you flying across the plains. Burrowing owl uh, is in some trouble in Canada. In the northern edge of its range, it has really lost its numbers. We had thousands in Canada when I started birding back in the 80s, and now we're down to a couple of hundred. Sprague's pipit is one of my favorite grassland songbirds. They have this this great habit of flying up into the sky to sing. You know, they drop their song from two or three hundred meters up. You can barely see them, just a dot up in the sky. It looks like this through your binoculars if you're lucky, and that would be about the best view you're going to get. But the song just kind of falls upon you as though the sun or the sky itself took voice. Here's a says Phoebe. One of the aerial insectivores you'll find out in the, in the western plains, kind of a cousin of the eastern Phoebe. And the loggerhead shrike, it is on our endangered species list. This is uh, uh, a young one, another young one here on a fence line, and one being fed by its parent. Uh, the, um, the race of the loggerhead shrike that breeds in, in southern Ontario is even doing worse, it seems. Its numbers are, are, are declining pretty fast. Sage grouse, we had a couple thousand um, a few years ago, 20, 30 years ago, I guess, and now we're down to maybe 100 in Canada. Uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service is really working hard on this one and put, has put quite a bit of funding toward it and some, some programming work with working with ranchers who 
who manage land that have sage grouse in, in Canada. And it we'll, remains to be seen whether we are going to get any results from that. But um, with reintroduction programs happening in Alberta, um, maybe we will see in the next 10 years some improvement. But uh, it's definitely a bird in trouble. The lark bunting, often called the white-winged blackbird by ranchers, a very erratic species. It kind of shows up depending on the, the weather and the year in big numbers or smaller numbers. It's uh, it's kind of a cool bird with a really neat flight song. And the females are kind of pretty. They have a really nice plumage. Here's a Baird Sparrow, uh, a great singer out on the open grass. And you hear them all the time when you're out on the big pastures of uh, the northern plains. Its cousin, the Grasshopper Sparrow, which is a wider range. The Baird Sparrow is really just in a restricted little circle of... Um, <clears throat> Eastern Montana, Western North Dakota, parts of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. But the grasshopper sparrow is, of course, in places like Ontario as well. Here's another shot of a grasshopper sparrow. And the two long spurs are both on the endangered species list now. Their, their ranges have really retracted quite quickly in the last couple of decades. Uh, this is the McCown's long spur. It's kind of a silvery color with that chestnut on the, on the wing. They have Beautiful flight songs. This, the Macau's long spur looks like this in flight. It'll be up tottering on the wind and, and singing maybe only 20 or 30 feet up in a, what's called a butterfly flight display. It's um, relative. The chestnut color long spur also has a flight song, but it's a little lower to the ground, more of a rollicking flight. And it has this beautiful chestnut on the nape and a great flashy tail. All the long spurs have, this kind of, have these kind of tails in different patterns. And the western meadowlark. We know it's a western meadowlark because it's sitting on a cowboy boot. This is Hamilton Greenwood photo. I wanted to include a photo of the whooping crane. This is by a friend, <clears throat> Annie McLeod. Um, it, I, I think of it as a grassland bird or a prairie bird, but most of us, I think, think of the whooping crane as a boreal forest bird because that's where they're breeding right now they are up at wood buffalo but that's just where they were discovered after they disappeared and were chased away from the plains by settlers 100 120 years ago but they were here uh, all the early records from traveling naturalists through the 19th century found whooping cranes now never in big numbers because it's a large bird they were pretty uh, dispersed over the plains but at big wetlands they were there out on the prairie so you know, part of why we're concerned about habitat for grasslands, uh, grassland birds in Canada, is that we have, as a country, kind of given up on, on managing their, their habitat for the public good. At one time, we had a terrific federal pasture system that a really good did a good job at managing land for, for both grazing and soil conservation, and water conservation, but also for biodiversity. And they had programs looking after endangered species. That was ended, unfortunately, in 2012 by the Harper government. And uh, although the land has not been sold yet, it is being managed privately, and it remains to be seen as to how grassland birds in those those you know acres are going to survive now. It's 2.2 uh, million acres of, of lands that formerly were managed by the federal government and are now being managed um, more or less privately by the producers. Um, we have to hope that they will do the right thing and um, manage grazing in ways that will be good for biodiversity as well as for putting meat on the hoof. One of the positive trends I've seen happening in grassland conservation is that we've seen the rise of some really bright stars in the grassland bird world and in bird conservation in, in the prairie. This is Nicola Coper from the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg does some great great work out on the plains. And this is Christy Morrissey from the University of Saskatchewan who's become famous around the planet really for showing how the toxins of things like neonicotinoids and others are affecting our aerial insectivores in agricultural landscapes. And we know that has to be having effect on our grassland birds as well. We've had some luck also, another piece of good news, in, in con conserving some specific pieces of grassland that were up for development. Um, this one, with the best of intentions, was going to be made into a wind farm. Well, there's lots of areas in Saskatchewan that are cultivated. Like I said, 80 or 90 percent of the prairie has been cultivated, so put the wind farms there. Instead, it was proposed for this area here at Chaplin, and this is a friend of mine helping doing bird surveys that we used 
to raise public interest and to raise the alarm over what would happen if this was converted into a wind farm. And we won that case, and we shut down this um, wind farm operation, and it's been moved to a nice spot on cultivated land west, further west in the province. So it's good news all around. It was one of my goals when we first started working on grassland conservation uh, to get more national attention for, for grassland and grassland birds. And I always thought it would be great if we could get David Suzuki and the Nature of Things crew out, out here to, to do a show. And they did last year. So we really felt good about that. Um, the, 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 the show is called Grasslands, A Hidden Wilderness, and uh, it's online if you want to take a look sometime. Here's a shot of us out together looking at, uh, or, or the, with, with the film crew, as my friend Ed and I were out doing our bird survey work. That was part of how I showed up in the episode as uh, kind of a person talking about the birds and the bird atlas work we were doing there on these big grasslands. Cattle producers have been, over the years, great conservationists, by and large. You know, most of them, especially in the southwest of Saskatchewan and southeastern Alberta, uh, really understand conservation and the, the role that cattle production and grazing can play in conservation as a kind of a ecological substitute for the bison that are missing. Uh, so they've been some very good allies over, over the years. And, you know, they really do care about the birds. This is a, a, a fellow who was a PFRA manager who rescued a short-eared owl one day. Uh, it was caught in the fence. All right. And, uh, you know, we we were so happy when Graham Gibson and Margaret Atwood came out and spent some time with us and helped us raise awareness about grassland and grassland conservation. They traveled with us in the southern parts of the province down to Grasslands National Park, and we just had a great time together, speaking to ranchers and uh, just in general, you know, helping us get some media attention and move the needle a little bit of public opinion on grassland. Here's a final shot of the two of them overlooking the Frenchman River Valley. And finally, I want to show you um, a little video uh, at the end that, that is a really good piece of news. I think pretty soon we are, think, we are going to hear the announcement from the Canadian Wildlife Service and Environment and Climate Change Canada of a large 200,000 acre uh, pasture or grassland that's going to be conserved and managed, kind of like a national wildlife area or maybe a national grassland, I'm not sure what they're going to call it, uh, and it will continue to be grazed, it will it'll can still have the, the cattle on it, but it'll be managed primarily for conservation, and there's already been good work done in the last year on, on um, bird conservation and studying, you know, the bird distribution on these pastures. This is right in the southwestern corner of Saskatchewan. Here's some images of that great big wide open landscape where where I usually go every year or so to help with the bird census work. It's a chestnut colored longspur nest. What we're doing a breeding bird atlas right beside a big cow pet. Well, it's time to wrap things up. Thanks for being part of uh, Spring Song this, this year. Um, I want to thank the Writers' Union of Canada and Canada Council for allowing me to be a part of this as, as a member of the Writers' Union and, and an author. Um, 
I wanted to say something about birds and birding and bird conservation during this kind of moment in, in history, during the pandemic. Uh, first of all, the birds, as we all know, help us take heart at difficult times. So it's time to get out birding, but it's also time to, to join the conservation groups like the Pelee Island Bird Observatory to participate in other local conservation initiatives that help birds out. I think that on its own uh, is good for our hearts in such times. So thank you for being supporters of PIBO and other environmental groups and I encourage you to continue doing that. There's a lot that can be done online. Certainly eBird works really well and, uh, and there's a lot of online work that can be done where you don't have to, to meet in large groups and go to conferences. So thanks again. Take heart. I, I hope to see you all again soon sometime on Pelee Island.